Um, and for those for those who for those of you who haven't uh, been part of the new part of the new format, we're going to we're gonna we're gonna present cases rather than go through a didactic lecture. This is what I've been told is the new the new the new yeah. best thing to do. Um, and I'm just trying to see who's online. Mm -hmm. Give us two minutes and we're going to start. Right. Dane, Dane, you are you one of the two coming up next, so you're going to be in the spotlight. Francis is with us. Um, Dane, are you good? Fine, thank you. And you? We're good. Okay. So we're going to start. There are a couple of people at the door, but don't worry about them. Um, so I'm just going to click on both of these. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fairly innocent question. What's the limit? Um, 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 I was wrong. Yes. Um, I'm going to say it's a left trend Ellenberg. Okay. Just, <clears throat> and I agree with you. Dan, can you run through with me? And and so I think for the purposes of a, an online exam, you're quite right. Just, just tell me how you get to that. Okay. So we have a video of a child walking away from me um yes. i am seeing that she is leaning uh on to, leaning towards her left side and her entire shoulder and, and head is leaning to the side so rather than dropping straight up and down I'm, I'm sorry to jump in and, and interrupt no but problem. when you say leaning towards i get mm -hmm. the impression that it is a sort of constant constant attitude of the body which i would then call a list okay so she's in back and forth different. so so she does lean but at only one stage in the gait cycle what stage yes is yes yes i'm sorry i should say that so when she's on the stance phase on her left leg she leans on across stance on the left at that point she Let's leans see. across over the left hip and okay. then when she's on standing on her right and she's on the right leg stance phase she is uh, normally aligned or vertical. Okay. Then, then just to just to then to take it a little bit further, and I, I often talk about certain registrars who, who come to prior self just say what it is, and and it's completely acceptable. I understand where you're coming from because I, I quite like short terms and succinctness. But you also, if I'm sitting with a memo pad, I also want to know a whole lot of other stuff. It's going to be, it's going to be cadence. It's going to be rotation. It's going to be shortening. Uh, it's going to be fixed flexion deformity. It's going to be rotation of the, the, the hip, the knee, and the ankle. Just so, just fill in the gaps for me. So far, you're quite right. There's nothing that I'm faulting you on, but I would like you to just take it a little bit further. Okay. Um, so it's an. Okay. How old is the child, boss? Sorry, three or uh, so, okay. two years old. Two years old, so it's an appropriately sized two year old child. Um, no obvious syndromic features, although obviously I'm not getting a lot of detail from the video alone. Um, the child's walking unaided. Um, the cadence is difficult to comment on, it's video is a bit jerky, but I believe it's normal. Um, Normal velocity, um, normal. Dan, you, I, I, I want to stop you there. How, how are you going to say that the cadence is normal? So we can talk about a cadence being fast and slow. I get that. Mm -hmm. uh, when I try and slow myself down, almost like beats to a bar, I try and count out left, right, left, right. And if they're not equal, then that's not a normal cadence. 
Yeah, it's, it's the video is a bit jerky on my side, but I thought I took that into consideration. I thought she had equal. She didn't have a longer stance on either leg. At, as, at long as long as you're getting that time. Yeah. But I, I I sort of go like at heel strike, left, right, left, right, left, right. And then once I counted out almost like music, it, it, it looks a little bit abnormal. I'm not going to disagree with you. I'm just saying I just have a system. Fine. Yeah. 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 What to assess. Okay. Um, yeah. Then, yeah, the stance phase is equal in both sides, implying yeah. that I don't think she's got any antalgia. Mm. Um, there's a normal, I believe, a normal heel strike and toe off on both sides. Okay. Um, the there's a normal normal foot progression angle. It seems that both of her knees and both hips, although again it's not completely clear, but they all appear to ex they extend at the appropriate time and the flex at the appropriate time. Um, she doesn't appear to have an exaggerated lumbar lordosis. Yeah. Um, and overall, in the coronal, and I can't really comment on the sagittal plane, but the coronal plane limb alignment appears normal for her age. And then we okay. spoke about the features of a Pendelenburg. Fine. Brilliant. Okay. You're off the hook. <laughs> um, so I'm not asking Francis is here. What what sign what sign am I trying to demonstrate with a series of uh, photographs? Yeah. Wait, 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 wait. So there. So, so number one, if if I'm trying to demonstrate Tendelenburg sign, mm -hmm. why would Prof. De Toy fight with me at this point about the the position of his right leg? Um, so you are so flexing your right leg when you're the flexes. Yeah. Um, and that. Might inadvertently pull the pelvis up a little bit otherwise. Okay. I'm not going to get into too much detail, but but technically you want the, the thigh uh, yeah. vertical next to the other thigh. You don't want it abductive because then it becomes a an outrigger and you want the knee bent backwards. And then just holding the this the whole picture there on the far left hand side. If you were to draw a line through the imaginary foramen magnum, it's going to come out at his heel. Roughly, where is it going to pass through? Oh, on the far left. In oh, other words, where, 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 where is the line of his center of gravity? It's still sent through the body, so it's medial to the standing. Because, um, where, if you were standing, it's between the and so at the level of the hips, where, where do you imagine it to be passing? Um, the pubic symphysis, okay. The, uh, and then, then we get on to the three shots that are now trying to, trying to demonstrate Jindelenburg. Um, just to be aware, so the three shots in the details, you can mm -hmm. find the left leg. And we can see right from the beginning, <laughs> That we shift the center of gravity over onto the right. Mm. And the pelvis is tilted with the left side up. Mm. Um, you don't see the series on the first uh, picture. We don't see an initial dip and then you're missed over, mm. um, which means perhaps it's compensating quite well. I will just, you know, miss it. Okay. But he's certainly looking for with the most left to the most right, 
Yeah, and so the polar I ten picture, I just want to know approximately where would you expect the, the center of gravity to have shifted in terms of his pelvis and his hips? In terms of the hips, um, if I look at his chin, sort of a rough mark, I'm trying to make his awkward shoulder with his head. Um, it's roughly over or just lateral to the hip. Okay. Um, and yeah, so then the last question, answers. In what language is Trindellenberg's original article written? It's in German. And have you read it in German? Nein, kind of. Uh -uh. So, so it is written in German. Does it, does it, does it? So you, you haven't read it. Uh, but I have, but I can't read German. The... It doesn't go on a lot about the, the orientation of the pelvis. It goes a, a yeah. lot about the orientation of the torso in conjunction with the center of gravity. Okay. So we're going to task you, because I've tried Google Translate. It gave me even more bizarre more nonsense than I normally get on a Monday morning. The, um, I'm going to ask you to, to translate it in a reasonable format. But Jen Dillenberg talks about the, the sway of the torso over the affected hip. Yes, Bradley, thank you very much. You've sent it to me once again. In German. Oh, is it the translated form? Okay. So, so, so because Bradley has shown such enthusiasm, you, you're going to just, just run us through this. Um, what is this, actually? What do we call this in... in the, the mechanic variety of physics. Mm -hmm. so the forces around the mm -hmm. Yeah. What do we what do we call the orientation of the forces and the summation, etc. etc. So, 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 so the the joint reaction forces, but but the diagram that 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 attempts to quantify those forces and their combined effects, what do we call it? It's a vector analysis, again. So it's, it's just looking at the vectors of the force. It's just trying to, to reconstitute it. Now, this is from, from Powell, and his name's going to come up later, but the first person to really try and quantify how the force is going through the hip uh, and come up with a resultant. So, so I'm, I'm now a fifth year medical student, Bradley, just, just try and explain to me in, in simple terms how in a normal and a Trendelenburg hip, what the forces, the resultant forces might be in, in this vector diagram. Starting with a normal hip. In a normal hip, how, how, much, how much force is being driven through the hip and why? We have had this conversation. Okay, so so Zama was there more recently. <laughs> Remember Zama, you on a group microphone. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so so Zama, that 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 the right hand red force downwards is going to be body weight. But remember that this is a body weight in single stance. So it's body weight minus minus the leg that's already on the ground. Yeah. Remember the leg that's already on the ground, the, that's, that force is not going through that hip. But the other leg is. Okay. So let, let's let's make it approximately, let's make it approximately body weight going through the simpsis pubis. That's the right hand red uh, force down. But now, there's a hip rotation center in the middle of the hip. That's now a, a fulcrum. The tip of the greater trochanter and leading to the second left hand red uh, arrow, that's going to be the force that is now trying to oppose that downward force of the right hand side downward force. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And because there's, there's a, a, a lever 
And because the lever is very, very, very approximately a one to three ratio, the force trying to be generated by the left hand arrow is approximately therefore three times as big as the downward force. And the downward force, uh, and I'm, I'm rounding off numbers here, but there's going to be about body weight. We end up very roughly with about three times body weight. That's the resultant that needs to be generated in order to stabilize the pelvis to keep that child upright. The far left hand uh, diagram, the far left hand photo over there. Got it. Hold that thought. Okay. So, so let's 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 just somebody have a look. Uh, how to, uh, yeah. I've got a laser pointer. So in, in my laser pointer, down here, and remember this child is in single stance, or the adult, single stance. This is going to be the, the body weight coming down through the center of the symphysis pubis, because that's actually uh, where our center of gravity falls when we're in single stance. So that's forced down. And let's make that... Let's make it a, a 70 kilo me, and let's my let's make my leg that's already on the ground, but not is outside of the picture of this this diagram. Let's make that that leg 10 kilos. So now I've got 60 kilos down over there. Right. Step number two is that over here, from from that force going down to the sense of my hip is, is a, a, a proportion of about three. This is the fulcrum in a lever. And this proportion over here is about one. So now I've got a lever with a, a one to three ratio. And remember, if I'm going to balance a lever, I'm going to need to generate a force. If, if the ends of the lever are unequal, I will need to generate a force proportional in the inverse to that lever, if that makes sense. So I've got one in three here. I've got 60 coming down. I therefore need to generate approximately 60 times three or about, about three times body weight over there in order to keep this, this whole system more or less uh, stable, in just in stance, eh? and doesn't account now for running and jumping. And and when I when I when we start looking at the vectors, and it's not really that important, but the line of the force is approximately here. And then, uh, Selma, just by the way, if you if you look at the trabecular pattern within the neck and the head of the, the proximal femur. The, the lines, yes, they, they come around here, up here. There are lines of tension and compression. But if you took all the lines of forces, both compressive and tensile, in the neck of the femur, they don't go, they don't go straight up. They, they generate themselves off in, a, in the same direction as this line, because that's where the direction of the pull is coming. Is, is that clear? It's important, because now we need to get on to the next slide. And and we're gonna uh, skulk. Skulk. Here's a, a medial displacement osteotomy. It's um it's a it's a quite an old operation. It it was done originally to to create a, a false roof for a an exposed femoral head. The theory was that you would create a fibrocartilaginous cartilage, uh, joint surface. We used it for perthes. We used it for developmental displays of the hip. Um, have you got a name for it? I don't mind if you don't. Um, I don't. I it's okay. I don't mind about that. It's called a Chiari. No, it's called a Chiari. 
How's the kind of alternate mechanics? So, um, it medializes your, you know? Correct. So, it says your lever point closer to the center of um, your Absolutely. Of, uh, your body weight. So, 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 by decreasing so that, yeah. By decreasing that distance, you then decrease the force that goes through the leg when it translates into the knee leg. Not through the leg, but through the? Through the center of the. Uh, the center of the hip. Just, just tell me then, if if we manage to push that osteotomy all the way to the midline, underneath the symphysis pubis, in contrast to the previous picture where we were generating about three times body weight, if we push this to the middle, what what would the resultant force in stance be on that hip? On the same Yeah. Well, the closer you get to the center, the closer you get to the body weight. Yeah. So it's three times the normal biomechanics. Mm -hmm. The closer you, you, you move the lever point, the closer it will be to one is one. Correct. So we're going to go to? Uh, one. Okay. So you're going to go to, 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 to body weight. At the same time, I'm just trying to, I'm, I'm going to point out that you're also going to be altering the abductor length. So bear that in mind. Remember that as you as you medialize, you're technically going to be slightly shortening the abductors slightly. So the the theoretical disadvantage of doing a chiari is that by shortening the abductors, you're going to be weakening them. But remember this: as you're going further and further towards the midline, you are almost not quite exponentially, but but in a in a very linear fashion, you are reducing the load necessary for, for the abductors to function until it becomes zero, actually. So if you could have both of your hips in the middle of your, your some sort of pubis, which is obviously impossible, you wouldn't need abductors at all, would you? Would you? No. Okay. So, so, so I just... <laughs> I just want to go backwards, backwards one step, and now revisit the far right hand picture, Scott, and, and, and ask you, were this child throwing his entire weight over the head of the femur, what's the resultant force in that hip going to be? So he's, he's done what the, the osteotomy has done, but he's moved the center of his um, body weight over the center of his hip joint. Yeah. So he's, he's basically eliminated his glutes and his cheating. Correct. Okay. Zama, if you get onto YouTube and you ask for the, 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 the primary cause of a Tendellenberg gait, what answer is going to pop up? Number one, weak abductors. And I'm, I'm just pointing out that, that in pediatrics, who's going to truly get weak abductors? No, don't shake your head. There are children who get weak abductors. Who are they? No, listen to the question. Who in pediatrics gets weak abductors? Who gets proximal muscle weakness or, or a true low motor neuron uh, effect on their abductors? So, proximal descents, classic bilateral weak abductors, proximal muscle weakness, definitely. So all of the muscular dystrophies, yes. Yeah, who else? Truly short, truly weak abductors. Yeah, 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 but you don't get slip discs in children, eh? Not commonly. Come on. Who, who, who gets a, a, a purely asymmetrical motor neuropathy that will, you will never see in your life, hopefully? Hmm? Polio. Polio, the classic, okay. And, and, and uh, I'm just, as, a, as an aside, I'm just trying to put it to you that, that if 40 years ago, 50 years ago, 
70 years ago, if 70 years ago our, our predecessors commonly saw polio and commonly saw weak abductors, they, they would have, it would have stuck in their heads that weak abductors lead to adrenal gate. I get it. But uh, I personally have never seen polio. I've seen the effects of polio, but uh, never polio. Okay. So, so the whole, we, we, we're now going to start with the, the evening's <laughs> topic, if we may. The, um, so we've got a deformity. Mm, uh, Francis, I'd like a, I'd like a, a, a group name. I'm going to drag you through classifications and, and how they might or might not help us. I want to know about clinical features, and I'd like to just get a, a sort of a, a hint of treatment strategies. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you got a, a P50. I'll go with it. Yeah. Okay, we'll, we'll come back to it. I'll give you a little bit of insight, but yeah, I, I'm, I'm putting you. Yeah. Okay, well done. Uh, in reference to? Yeah, okay. So, so, so you're not going to be able to see that. What other associated feature, and you, which you also will not be able to find, what else around the knee are you going to be looking for? Do you, do you lose patella? In? No, leave it out then. Femoral condyles? Mm, what? Hyperplasia, yeah. Okay. Yeah, what do we call that? Yeah, so we, we, so we, we, we talk about the hemimelia, but the new classification is going to go towards a, a complete longitudinal arrest. Uh, that's a new nomenclature, but I'm, I'm, I don't know at what point. At what point uh, can I just like put my foot down and say, I've done this my whole life, I'm always going to do it. Fibula hemimelia, fibula plaza. But it is in, in the new nomenclature, it's going to be a, a complete or partial uh, transverse arrest of, of a segment. Yeah. And going down the stream, ankle. Why, why ball and socket? You spot on. Yeah. 
No, she's wrong. Zama, why are you going to get a ball and socket ankle? And don't back out of this, I told you. Yes. Zama, just, just remind us again, what, what's the four-week um, um, uh, uh, degradation of knowledge? What are you 80%. going to... 80%. 80% of will do by four weeks. What's the only way that we're going to improve that? Repetition. Repetition. Okay. Why are you going to get a ball and socket ankle? You've got a tarsal coalition. Why? Why is a tarsal coalition going to give you a ball and socket ankle? I'll just go through it because if, you, if you've if got stiffness in your subtalar joint, then you're going to start compensating at a very early age for the lack of or various valgus at your subtalar joint, you're going to incorporate it into your ankle joint. So anything that blocks off your subtalar motion is going to result in a ball and socket ankle. Okay. So you can you can infer by the time you've got a ball and socket, you've got a tarsal coalition, which is a feature of, of this disease. What else are you going to look for? Absent lateral raise. Good. Anything else? So I'm just gonna, I'm gonna, and I'm, I'm quite happy with all of that. And and you know, it's a, quite a specialist topic. I don't expect you to know everything. In my head, if you look over here, um, that this this bulbous tuft is an indication of an Aitken class one, Aitken A, sorry, class A. So there will be a, a head present here, but it's not yet visible. In fact, it is visible. If we turn down the lights, it's going to be visible. In between is going to be, in this group, there's going to be a communication, a precursor, which in German we term ein, unlarge, an unlarg, the, the plural is unlargen. Uh -huh. So there's going to be a cartilaginous bridge over here. The point is that, that there's a communication, all that we're going to end up with is going to be a coxa vara. And we may have to correct that, but we don't have to create that bridge. Um, we also know because there's a tiny femoral head and an acetabulum that you're going to have a normal hip joint. And I'm just telling you this, it's, it's an aside, but in plain, plain radiology, if you get that candy licked appearance, that you know, the candy licked, you know what I'm talking about? Nobody goes to. You. So, so, so in the old days, we used to go to black, um, I don't know, the, the uh, agricultural shows. Yeah. And you'd buy these little sticks of candy that they're shaped like a, a shepherd's crook. We'll get onto those later. And you would sit and suck them a the whole day, but they would, you would suck them into a point. They would get that that point. Okay, let's put it a different way. If you pull the fizzer, if you if you okay, let's let's forget that analogy. Let's say, let's say that you take your fizzer and you haven't taken it out of the fridge and it's a hot day. You want to pull yourself a thing, but it's too warm to just break. Your fizzer, you pull it. What are you gonna end up with? That long thin stick. That's what the Aitken class B looks like. Um, this has got a stump there. Class B has got that, that fizzer, the pulled fizzer. Okay, there we go. All right. But now, class B, Francis, has it got a femoral head? It does still have a femoral head. Does it have an acetabulum? Has an acetabulum. Is there a present unlarg that you can build on? No. That's the part that's missing. You need to reconstruct that that unlog in order to create a, a workable head. In your Aitken C, have you got a femoral head? No. Have you got the, the pulled fizzer appearance? Yes. Very short, stumpy pulled fizzer. Have you got a workable hip? No. And so, so now you're going to have to have a different st strategy because you haven't got a femoral head, a, a working hip joint to, to, to use anymore. 
lastly, in your Aitken class D, have you got a, a femoral head? No. Have you got an acetabulum? No. You're stuck with a very short femur and you need to, to have a different plan whatsoever. Okay. We're all happy so far. So your, your treatment strategy in terms of a PFF D is going to, to rely on this. Now, <clears throat> just an aside, we, we used to, I used to ask for an MRI at quite an early age, a year, to try and work out what's going on. But in fact, we're only going to really start reconstructing at about four. So my current strategy, and these are rare, is to do an MRI at about the age of four uh, and at the same time do an MRI of the knee. So, so the two in conjunction. Have we got a, a, a ligamentously uh, deficient knee and do we need to reconstruct the hip? Then we would start with the hip, then do the knee and then address the leg length. And that kind of makes sense. And all of that is based on, on the components that we have based on the Aitken classification. And I know that there are different classifications. Happy with that. But that kind of works for me. By the way, just going backwards, to me, just because I'm a little bit simple, a little bit simple, uh, to me, <clears throat> if, you, if you have a, a workable hip, that to me is like a class one. You're going to sort out the hip, sort out the knee, address the leg length discrepancy. If you are a C and a D, then there's no point in sorting out hip at all because it's not there. You need to start revising your entire strategy. We can talk about it a little bit, but are you going to plug the, that, that remnant of the proximal femur back into the acetabulum? Are you going to start twisting in terms of rotation plasty? Are you going to talk about a reconstructive ablation? That kind of makes sense. Okay. Right. Oh, so, so Dane, Dane, you, 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 your, your job is easy now. You look at this child, tell me what are the classic clinical manifestations of a proximal femoral focal deficiency? Um... I think the term you've used before is a steam boat. Ships, yeah, it's a ship funnel, ship funnel ship. deformity. Yeah. yeah, well done. Um, and the obvious shortening, uh, that goes without saying. Um, I mean, yeah, on inspection, I don't know if there's much else. And then if you're going to start uh, examining more specifically, you're going to get, as Francis mentioned, potential knee ligament deficiencies and femoral hyperplasia, so the knee itself might be unstable. Um, I think you can have varying degrees of, of instability of that ankle, absent lateral raise, as we've mentioned as well. Yeah. Um, hip, hip, just, just tell us the, the four things in the hip. Oof, I don't think I know four things. Um, okay, so flexed extended. Uh, I'm gonna go with flexed, abducted, flexed, yeah, flexed. externally rotated, fixed, a b ducted, externally rotated, a, ducted, yeah, yeah, and shortened, uh, mm. and short. There we go. Okay, so okay. you got all of those. And 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 when you look at the hip, that's why we talk about the ship's funnel. Is this short, stubby little uh, femur? And it it is. It's flexed up. It, it sits there, and it. it because it's flexed, it, it, it slopes backwards like a ship funnel. Okay, got it. There's my eight pin classification. I'm not going to dwell on this. To, oh, just to, to point out over here. To me, the this bulbous tuft is the A, the B is the, the um, your pulled fizzer. C has got no head, D has got no acetabulum. Uh, I'm going to run through this. Dane, just, just so, so draw Paley 
has to have has to have these fancily named operations. If you if you had to explain to the very most junior registrar, what does a super hip entail? Are you going to be able to get there? Uh, no, I don't think so. It does stand for something. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a um, I can't remember right now either. Uh, it is something, something utilitarian procedure, but da but da but da but da. So, so I'll uh, exactly in essence, you you open the hip, you take away all of those soft tissue deforming forces that lead to the deformities that we mentioned. So you're going to get rid of the flexors, the abductors, and the external rotators. You strip all of those muscles away. Then you get down to either the coxa vera or the complete dissociation between head and, and shaft, and you reconstruct that via a, a valgus type reconstruction stroke osteotomy, plus minus bone graft, and you close everything up. And you can see why Draw Paley has got an institute, and I'm just giving a touch. Got it. Now, Salma. Salma, we, we, we're progressing down a similar road, but something a little bit different. What are we dealing with, Salma? Oh, we've got a chat there. Who's chatting? Can't even get that. Yeah? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, Don't just say deformed. Explain to me how. Okay. I've been unfair. I haven't shown you the whole the whole femur. It's it's yeah. going to be short. Hmm. No, no, no. We no, no, no. It's just just a congenital short femur. Yeah. So, so. One of the other classifications of your PF50 is Papas, and Papas includes congenital short femur. Mm -hmm. I, just because I, I want to be, I don't know, um, pedantic, I think that the embryological uh, origin of the hip and intertrochanteric proximal femur is one unit. And so that, to me, fits embryologically into your PF50. The shaft of the femur is not part of that at all. So I don't count this as part of that. And, and in fact, your congenital short femur doesn't come with your fibula hemimelia, absent lateral rays, tarsal coalition, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. I think that they are different disease processes. It doesn't matter. I'm just being pedantic. This is this is a, a congenital short femur. It might have a coxivera, and we're going to deal with coxiveras later. But now, Salma, mm -hmm. I'm telling you now that this child is, is male, that the leg length discrepancy at this point is three centimeters. You can send a little secret note rolled up in a like a ball and, and shot through a pen at um, Salma. She might help you out here. Next. Uh, Leg length discrepancy at the age of 3.5 in a male child is three centimeters. I want to know from you how you're going to get to an expected leg length discrepancy. There's a table. Okay. Yeah. You want me to get you a table? Okay, it's coming up. Yeah, wait, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. Yeah. Coming away, do you want a table for males or females? Okay, wait, other charts. 
Uh, okay. There we go. Because you're just gonna you're gonna have to work around that. There's a the table. Tell us how it's gonna work. So, um, the age of the child. <laughs> 3.5. So 0.5 would be 12 times a half. <laughs> yeah, what have you got? But there's an app. You can use the app. You can use the app. So, so go to the app. Go to the app. Go to the app. I don't mind. <laughs> Just, just explain to me. I'm, I'm waiting. All right. And you're not allowed to use chat GTP. So yeah. And remember that the bottles on the table are going to be picked up by the, the unidirectional the, the multi directional mic. Yes. <laughs> Come on, tell okay. them. Um, Generally, uh, yes. you have your this is the patient's age. You have the accepted uh, birth within that length. So and please don't repeat the question. The yes, that, that's what you is. use. I know. You use the app and you put it in the app and it gives you your feed. <laughs> show me, show me how you use the app. You got the app in front of you. Okay. So lesson number one. I don't mind if you're going to have an app. I will give you a cell phone in your in your exam, mm -hmm. but don't tell me I'll use the app if you can't use the app. There they are. So so. Yes, hands up. Like so, the yes. Can be proportional because it's congenital. Yes. Yeah. So Step number one. Yes. Yeah. And then you can figure out proportionally. Okay, so I'm just being practical now. Uh, let's tell me how you're going to do that. You are um, three point five years of age, and your leg length discrepancy is three. So, so Francis, question so number one. About... Question number one is 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 according to you, if you if you've got a um, let's let's call it what they are. You've got a multiplier. Yeah. If I take a normal femoral length. And I multiply it according to the age. Summer, you you tell me off that, that chart. Mm -hmm. You've got a female that is 10 centimeters long. The multiplier at the age of three and a half is 2.13. So let's make it two. Okay. 10 centimeters, you're going to have a 20 centimeter female. And if the other female is, is now 15 centimeters, you're going to end up with a 30 centimeter female. Okay. Then you can take the two and you can subtract one from the other and you're going to get an eventual leg length discrepancy. But if you mathematically work it out, you're multiplying long and short by the same amount. What you can actually do is just take the difference. The difference at this stage is three centimeters, Selma, mm -hmm. multiplied by 2.13 or whatever it is. You're going to end up therefore with about a six centimeter leg length discrepancy. Can you get how mathematically yeah. they're going to be the same? I, I, I don't need for you to know all of the details, but I, I do need for you to be able to say this is what we're dealing with. All right. And and for those of you who'd like to go and look for charts, Green Anderson, by the way, if you would like them, I'll provide them. I just want to see the hard is it you're getting to an approximate value given the fact that you, you, you're you going to be chatting to people about, about six centimeters. So, so, so now, now, now let's suppose you've got a six centimeter Selma leg length discrepancy. What are you going to advise the parents? How, how are we going to go about it? Um, so you can, um, okay, what I would advise parents is that you can lengthen the schema stages. Yeah. Um, 
Um, Stage lengthening. Okay, I'll accept it. Um, the no, I'm going to stop you there. Uh, I fully accept you're going to stage lengthening six centimeters. I got it. Mm -hmm. What if they expected the discrepancy was going to be two centimeters? Um, well, then that you don't necessarily have to uh, lengthen because uh, you can just uh, accommodate, so to speak, the other length you have with the heel raise. Heel raise? Uh, so something that will affect the patient's mobility. So shoe raise. Shoe raise, I'm, I'm happy with that. Or you can leave them alone. So you, <clears throat> we consider up to two centimeters at adulthood to be within, within normal. Fine. What about 10 centimeters? Right. Uh, that is quite a uh, important uh, length and discrepancy. Mm. Um, so depending on when this child is represents to you, mm -hmm. uh, once again, you can either do stage Same thing, the age three and a half. Where you can do stage lengthening and then you can then do guided growth on the outside. Uh, so, 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 so when you talk about, just be careful about saying guided growth because okay. we're normally talking about angular deformities. Mm. So speak to me about a pivotalesis. Mm -hmm. Okay. I know that we do do in and out of guided growth. It's controversial and it's supposed to have quite a high rate of complications. Just tell me a pivotalesis. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you're going to shorten the long side mm -hmm. and lengthen the other. Fine. Okay. I'll get to that. What about 15 centimeters? So, so then maybe a, a, a better question to ask would be what percentage of a limb segment can you lengthen at a sitting? Um, well, it um, mm -hmm. Throw it out there, is that my helper? I'll go with about 15, 15 centimeters, depending on what. But let's leave it at about 15. Remember, the, the, the bigger the portion, the more complications you're going to run into. Okay? Um, so eventually you're going to get to a point, theoretically, that you, you can't lengthen enough. You're going to add a pivotalesis on the other side. Mm -hmm. But around about 15-ish percent, at, uh, 15 centimeters, absolute you you're starting to look towards thinking about a reconstructive okay. ablation so That's converting to prosthesis all right okay uh brad where is he oh there you are brilliant brad we're having a small pause for uh pizza for those of us who did get here so there will be some Sorry about that. Um, for those outside, uh, just 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 think about telling us how we're going to. What's the difference between a beam and a cantilever? Mm -hmm. I'm I'm your next door neighbor, and I'm a hairstylist. So you know, male hairstylist. No. So a cantilever is like a flagpole that sticks out of your, your garden with a flag hanging down. Yeah. Or, or that rock that um, Maritz has got a photograph of himself on, the diving board rock. That's a cantilever. And a beam, a beam is, is what now? It's been the same for about 50 years now. You can't say that in open forum, it's all being taken. Now, whereas a beam is is two bricks with a with a beam between it. Okay. Now, now I'm I'm gonna lead you through the next part of this. Everybody get some pizza. Uh 
I, I, I did vaguely mention that you could look this up. No, 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 In an ideal world, we're going to we're going to always lengthen completely straight. Hmm? No, it doesn't. You just have to remember that you're not lying it up on the shaft, you're lying it up on the mechanical axis. How much do they differ? Mm -hmm. About seven now. Okay. If we if we lengthen on the anatomic axis, what's going to happen? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it you got in the various of Albus. Albus. Well done. Well done, so far. Mm -hmm. So technically, what, what's going to happen if you use a fancy nails? Those intermodality. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. You're going to go into Elvis, technically. Okay. Yeah. It's just in relevance to the, the discussion we had a little while ago. Okay. What actually happens if you use a cantilever and you put it through your anatomic axis in reality? Well, have a look at what happened there. Just one outside. Remember, a beam, a beam goes from block to block. So the cantilever goes from the side. What's happening there? You're getting more force on the one side. Yeah, so creating pairs. Which contracts with Elvis. Yeah. Because it's a very theoretical yeah. kind of a point. But I just wanted you to think about it. Okay. Right. We're all happy. Dad pizza. Cool. Is that neat? <laughs> okay. <laughs> just check. Dama, yes. what is this? This is a mm -hmm. <laughs> Good. Another inspired and not dated. Okay. Those cocks are better, eh? You're getting going. I'm just looking at the um, five mm -hmm. and he thought that we could do stuff. And mm -hmm. uh, they have that uh, triangular capital inverted wire fragment. Well done. Yeah, I'm going to stop you there. We'll get back to you. So, I wanted you to just, just tell me. I wanted to point out who, who in the department is a lumper. Lumper. What's the difference between a lumper and a splitter? Have you never heard my Professor Solomon's talk about lumpers? So a lumper refers to the fact that that if you if you want to look at things like medicine, certain people group things together. They're going to lump them. So on the left-hand side, you have you have the, the, the diagnostic chart of a physician trying to get to the bottom of an email. On the right-hand side, you have an orthopedic chart. Got it. And actually, there's only one step in it. Fine. Got it. 
So, this is a group. This is a group of Coxavara. Francis, top left. What's that? What's that? No, top left. It's a femur fracture with Coxavara. Then, summer, middle, top. Coxa magna and breva, yeah, and Coxavara is as a result of, no, I know you know, put your hand up. Come on, what's that? Come on, what gives you Coxa magna, breva, breva magna, and vara? Hmm? <laughs> Oh, yeah. Was it at the Alice meeting? Okay, there you go. Yeah. What's it? But uh, no, 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 it's birthies. Okay, you. A mushroom head, yeah. Okay. No. <laughs> Scout for your, for your trouble. There is a cox of our top right. Top yeah. right, look at the other bones. Now, you can send it, but I can, I think, I don't know if I can zoom it in. Okay, there is osteopenia, widened fasces, and bone. Yeah, well, rickets. Yeah. Okay. And then lastly, we have, we have, oh. Um, I'm going to blow this up a little bit, but, but, but we have a, a widened neck coxavera, a ground glass appearance, which is the giveaway. Oh. 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 What have we got? Ground glass. Fibrous oh, displays. Okay. If you're a lumper, what pulls these together? As as Coxabara? Well, they're all acquired. They're all acquired. Um, there might be, there might be soft bones. What are any of the causes for soft bones? Oof, yeah, run through it with us. Fibrous dysplasia. Osteoporosis. P, I've got P, yeah. I've got P, pair, um, P, P, pair. P, hang on, P, 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 H, P, H, so I've got Padgett, yeah. and I'm that's not right, children, okay, you're going backwards, but, yeah, okay. um, Fibrous dysplasia, um, yeah, three O's, so, so P and H and three O's and then F, Fibrous dysplasia, the F, got it, okay. the three O's are, Padgett. Uh, yeah. H would be for one. Um, Hyperthyroidism. Hyper 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 which is rickets. Soft bone. Soft bone, rickets. Okay, fine. So that's my that's my acquired group of Mimozoma, Malampa. Mm. The acquired group, yeah. Mm. Add to that anything else? Trauma? Mm. Growth arrest? Tumor? Infection? Got it. Who did we get to? Francis, what's this group? Condenal. Okay, so you got your P50 on the top left. Middle. Middle. Funny Farsis. MED. MED SED group. Far out. The true, actually, congenital Oxavera. Happy with that? Cool. Well, 
Well, you, you know, there are many things that will give you a congenital anatomical abnormality of coxivara. But there's only one that stands all by itself that only has coxivara. Quite rare. And that's it. You get it. I'm, and I'm, I'm saving a question for you. Don't worry. So... <laughs> So here you here you are. This in the lumpa group. This is fits where? What do we call this? We, I agree with it. It's idiopathic, but we call it. Great. Well done. That little triangle you're trying to tell me about is called. No. Mm -mm -mm. Whose triangle? Hmm. Hey, back. Come. Oh, yes, 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 yes. yes. Come. So, this is your. Tell us again what it's called. This type of coxivera. Developmental. But it's actually idiopathic. Mm, just, just, it's confusing. It's the one that's idiopathic. It just occurs out of nowhere. No. We need to know, Zana, don't we, is, is how far down the line we're going to go. And so when we look at this idiopathic or developmental coxivara, you need to try and work out, is this thing going to progress or not? And if we treat it, how are we going to treat it? And as a, the very last think events of this evening, you're just going to step by step run us through the process of working out how we're going to get there. Okay. Good. The thing that you mentioned, we kind of see the natural history so we can anticipate the progression of the uh, conformity. And oh. then we're gonna, so we look at the token rhino perfectly or handbook. Well then, how's that work? Once you draw the hill horizon, you can color it. Okay. Yeah. And then you make a line that's parallel through the normal, you let into the side. 25? And then gray zone where you see 25. Oh, wait. Hold on. I thought you were green. Uh, hold on, Bart, give me two seconds. Let me lump it up. <laughs> um, we know that more than 60 when you operate, 40 to 60. Correct. Is okay. So, okay. under 40, you can leave. Yeah. Discharge from the clinic, eh? Discharge. Discharge. You've just told me. Yeah. No, don't hit your bits. <laughs> don't hit your bits. Can't continually be seeing things <laughs> that you guys can't discharge. Listen, 40, discharge. Okay. Fine. Yeah. 40 to 60? No, you just watch them. Maybe. Okay. And then? And then more than 60, I, we need to do a video. No, wait. <laughs> so, so now you've got a, a, a normal on this child's left, your right, and an abnormal. Mm. And let's just say for the sake of argument that the, the normal on this child's left is, is 20. Uh, if, the, if both sides were affected with the same condition, what normal would you assume? It's going to be the normal 80 children for a population oh, standard, yes? I think that's part of the ages. No. No, no, no. No. This this chart that he's looking for doesn't measure the H E angle. No, it doesn't have the next one. Correct. So tell us what, what would be a, a population standard normal H E angle that you you caught to the bilateral disease? Come anybody? 16. 16. So if you haven't got the other side to measure off, go for 16. Now, now we've got a, let's say we've got 80 on the bad side. And we've eight zero. 80. 
So I pushed you into it. It looks about 80. I pushed you into an operative zone. When you correct your, your HE angle, what are you going to correct? Oh, um, the aim is to Thirty-eight. No. Is that not the what do you want both of them to add up to something? No. Mm -hmm. So you're going to aim for the, the other side. You want to you aim to go that? back to the other side. Oh, or okay. if they're both abnormal, you're going to aim to put them both to 60. As I've told you, population stand is going to be 16. If you want to default, uh, that's the average we're going to take. Okay, so even if the other side is like... 40 and the abnormal side is no, 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 no. If, if they're both 80, you're going to put both to 60. Oh, okay. oh. but no, so I'm telling you that your left hand side normal is 20, the bad side is 80. How much of a, an angle are you going to take? Yeah, 80 minus yeah. other side 20. Yeah, okay, gotcha. And, and I've just drawn this out, and I don't need for you to, to remember this, but this is, and I said we, we would get back to him, Paul, this is his osteotomy, or a, a what I call idiopathic, but you call developmental correctly, um, coxavara. Just, just tell me, what are the components of this osteotomy? There's the angular correction, I get you. But what else is happening here? Okay. You're not just doing a closing wedge, are you? That's why I both can see the closing wedge, but also like medializing. Correct. Yeah. So so just 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 explain to me why you would want to medialize a a valgus osteotomy and and lateralize a various osteotomy. So with the valgus osteotomy. Mm -hmm. then... So I yeah, suggest you stand up, you stand up and you get a, a, a the top of a coffee mug. Draw a circle. So I'll draw you a circle. I'll draw a circle. If you're doing, if you are doing, then I agree with you. A pen. So let let's let's let us suppose. I haven't got a pen. Yeah. So let us suppose that your your center of rotation. Got to again. Yeah. Let's suppose the center of rotation is over here of your deformity. But let us suppose that you have to do your osteotomy in the greater circle over here. Yeah. If, you, if you're doing a valgus osteotomy, your, your femur is going to, to follow the track of that circle that way. Yeah. Is that correct? Just in, in general kind of processes. So that's going to be a valgus osteotomy. You're going to end up generally lateralizing. But if you are doing, if you are, so hang on. So, so in this case, you've got various, you're doing valgus. You actually be dragging us around. You want to, your if you if you're doing the closing wedge, actually, actually you should be to, you should be lateralizing. In this case, you're quite right. You are medializing, keeping. In this case, you you medializing, keeping your 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 weight bearing zone over the, the femur. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Cut myself there. Right. This is the classic pals osteotomy there. Right. Next. Next. I'm not sure what. Actually, we've got next. This is me fiddling. Okay, so here's, here's that child. 
I'm actually, I'm done with all of the stuff that I wanted to get through. Here's the ISO classification. Here is your longitudinal deficiencies, correctly termed, no longer tibial aplasia. I don't think there was anything else. So I'm throwing it out there. Um, I'm just getting the guys in the group. Are there other questions? Any questions? I'd like to ask, what, especially with um, your various okay. analogous osteotomies about the hip, yeah. does epiphysiodesing the greater trochanter have any role to play in uh, sort of preventing the deformity developing again, or is it simply used to prevent trochanteric overgrowth? The deformity okay. being, so if, you, if you've gone from a valgus hip in a CP or whatever, and you put it into varus to prevent dislocation, and you do or don't do a greater trochanteric epiphysiodesis. Yeah. Yeah, so, so, so I get the question. You follow, if you follow the screen over here, uh, embryologically, your physis is actually actually embryologically a continuum. Now we've got that kind of very shaky line there. Yeah, I see it. So so if you if you stop the your your greater trochanter growing, then in effect what you're going to end up with at a relatively early age, you're going to you you're almost getting a tethering effect and you're going to end up with with a uh, coxa vulgar. Yeah? Okay. Making sense so far. So we, we know that if we start doing trochanteric entry points for femoral nails in children under the age of about eight, they're going to end up with coxa vulgar. Might not be the end of the world, but we just need to bear that in mind. And so in a similar way, if you think like CP, that you might be ending up with a various hip, and those various hips occur for, for reasons that that are of muscle imbalance, about lack of compression during weight bearing and non weight bearing child, but a, a whole lot of other factors. One of the one of the strategies that could be used is to do it's called a growth modulation of the medial proximal femoral plasis with a medial screw. Is so that in part way to answer your question? Yes. There's, is there a part that I'm missing? Um, why do we, why do we not typically do anything to the greater trochanter? Because if you if you're thinking about CP, the last thing that you want to do is to create cox valga, because that's going to push the head out of the joint. Okay. If you want to protect a, if you want to protect a, a potentially dislocating hip, you want to have a various hip. You want to drive yes. that. Okay. Drive that that um, that that joint reaction force medially, not upward. But could you use the greater trochanter in the diesel in the coxal group that you mentioned? Yeah, no. So you submit that for for, for the, the ethics research. Mm, let's see, because nobody's ever done it before. Oh, okay. Maybe it was. I don't know. So then, then, so you get a greater trochanteric undergrowth and a long head, and now you've got a mismatch of your abductors. I don't know. Listen, it's, it's Tuesday evening. It's nine o'clock. You, you, you put that in the big list of big questions. It's like slow down. Why, why don't you put like little, 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 um, little growth modulation plates, little eight plates, little eight plates. Okay, you get on to it. Fine. Yeah. Uh, but I, okay, so, so we laugh a little bit, but I, but I definitely do think that um, I think so. So who, who's going to get coxavera? It's going to be the congenital group. You know, I, mean, I, I don't think in a congenital group you're going to get away with just tweaking a, a, an apophysis because that's really what it is. Then we're going to have the the 
the developmental group where already you've got a sheer, basically got a sheer non-union of, mm. of this, this weird Cox of Vera. I don't think it's suitable for them. Uh, you may have a point with a malunited proximal femur fracture. So now you've got a proximal femur fracture. You 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 want to you want to kind of stimulate. You want to preferentially encourage growth. Let's say on the medial neck side by slowing it down on the lateral popliteal side. Maybe you've got a point. And and I had a kid today in the clinic. I don't want to operate on him. He has got he has got Boeing. It's getting better. I've seen it over six months. It's getting better. So you want to put in eight plates? Okay, fine. But I think you're kind of fiddling a little bit and not addressing the problem. But theoretically, I agree with your point. In a group that is not congenital and is not the idiopathic stroke developmental form that I think has got beyond growth modulation, theoretically, yes. There you go. Any other questions? Then you're about the only person who seems to be talking sense anymore. The lack of pizza. <laughs> yeah, I think it's a pizza effect. Any 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 other questions? Three, three chats. How do I, I don't even know how to get there? 